There we go. So welcome everyone. My name is Kari Kwas. I am with the Conservation District. Uh, this evening, we are going to be talking about the journey of a raindrop. Love the name. But what we're really talking about is how water moves through when it falls from the sky and then hits the pavement and goes into a storm drain and off. What's process? What's not? How the city handles that. And our main speaker this evening is April Hines. She's the Senior Public Information Education Specialist with the City of Everett. She works at Public Works. So I'll do a little more in depth introduction there in a second. And then again, I'm Kari with the district. You've probably seen me on, I don't even know how many of these at this point, <laughs> um, but feel free to reach out to me. I deal in community engagement and that is all kinds of different things. The photo there is from our Tale of Two Rivers, which was a film festival that we had earlier this month. And then also of note, Orca Recovery Day is coming up next month. And the same day that we're doing that, April will be hosting a rain garden tour in Everett. So we'll talk about those events as well. So today for the uh, webinar, please use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have a technical issue, feel free to use the chat and then either Virginia or I will help you with those questions. Um, we are recording this and then I'll be sending it out after the fact. So even for those that couldn't come this evening, they'll be able to view this later. So quickly, what a conservation district is, we are a non-regulatory special district, like a fire district. We Our job is conservation. And so we work uh, with landowners and land managers across Snohomish County and in, on, on Camino Island. There's 45 conservation districts across the state of Washington, and we offer free technical assistance, education like this. Um, we'll come out to your property and let you know what maybe you could be doing better, some best practices, that sort of thing. Um, but we have no regulatory authority over anything. So we're just going to be the good advice people and feel free to ask us any questions about your land. So for Everett, 75% of the pollutants enter Puget Sound comes from stormwater runoff. And that is why we are here tonight, because we're trying to control or have some impact on what is going into our waterways. There are different things that we can do on land to make sure that that does not go out to sea. Um, so that's why the City of Everett sponsors these classes, and it's in partnership with WSU Extension and then the Conservation District, but the city is paying for this class tonight. So they have 22 drainage basins in the city, which is kind of an astounding number, really. Um, so the daily choices we make absolutely affect those draining, drainage basins. Sometimes you can't see the water. Um, it might be going underneath you or through pipes, or maybe there's a stream near your home. But it's important to know that everything we do, everything flows downhill. So the other things that we're planning for, one thing this weekend um, is the rain barrel sale. And so that's going to be Saturday morning from 9 to noon down at the Public Works building at 3200 Cedar Street. And then next week on Thursday, we're going to be doing a second webinar, Wet Feet Gardening. And this one, if you've noticed, we haven't had rain in I don't know how many months. <laughs> so it's, our seasons have sort of turned from dry. And then we know the rains may be coming tomorrow, but we expect a wet winter again. La Nina is here. So how can you plant your garden to be able to absorb that water and or have successful plants in that kind of condition where it's either drought or very wet? Um, separately in October, there's going to be a rain barrel workshop. That's it for the, the do-it-yourselfers. If you want to build your barrel and learn how to do that, so maybe you can do it again on your own later. That's what that workshop's about. And then again on October 15th, Orca Recovery Day for us, then we're going to be doing a rain garden tour in North Everett. Um, and that will probably start at Washington Oaks, but we will let you know for sure. So register for that class. Um, and same thing for the wet feet gardening at everett.eventbrite.com. And at this point, I'd love to have Virginia Blaine from WSU Master, uh, WSU Master Gardener go through these slides because we are happy to have her on. Um, Mary Watts is the new program manager for WSU Extension and she could not be here this evening. So Virginia, I'll turn it over to you. All right, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. All right, so these are our Master Gardener program priorities. They inform our efforts to help educate the community. And as you can see, water is one of the things at the top of the wheel here. And so that ties right into what you'll be hearing about tonight. Next slide. So what are we? We are university trained to provide science and research-based answers to home horticulture questions. 
And individually, I know certainly for myself, we don't know everything, <laughs> but we will search for a sound answer to your question that will be based on science and research. Next slide. So there are a couple ways you can ask a master gardener a home horticulture question. You can call our hotline. You can email plant pictures or questions to our email hotline. We also have an office clinic and we are at various community clinics seasonally throughout the area. Um, I'm going to go ahead and post these links and things into the chat box a little bit later so don't feel like you have to scroll them down right now. Next slide. And one of our upcoming events is our Growing Grocery series of classes. It starts in October and it's once a month, October, November, and December, and then it's weekly, January through March on Wednesday evenings, and it's on Zoom. So we'll put this information in there as well. And there's more places to get general information about us or how to become a master gardener. I've been a master gardener since 2015, and we're a great community of people to be involved with. And I think that's all you've got for me. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Virginia. Sure. And then back to April. Um, so April and I have worked together, I don't know, several years now <laughs> on these. Um, and this class tonight is going to be fun just to kind of see how things move through the city. But again, a reminder that we do this in the spring and we do something in the fall. So if there's a topic that is inter of interest to you, by all means, reach out to either uh, April or myself, and we will try and get that into the schedule. So at this point, I would love to turn it over to April. Hello, everybody. Um, so let's see here oh wait i gotta wait for you to finish stop sharing there we go um all right let's get started here um all right am i good you are good okay awesome um so yeah so today we are going to travel with some raindrops we're going to follow it even though we haven't seen it yet i agree with kari that it's coming and it's going to be a wet wet winter so let's actually take some time to actually follow those raindrops and follow where they actually go learn how nature actually deals with rain and then how do cities deal with all that rain um, and we're going to follow those raindrops as they flow through our neighborhoods and actually hopefully as we go along and follow these raindrops we'll see how we actually have an effect on the quality of that rain as it runs off of our local waterways but first let's actually talk about how much rain we're actually talking about. So when we're talking about it, I'm gonna, it says quiz time, but really it's not a super big quiz. You're not gonna be tested on it. It's just something that I want you to think about for a minute. So well, which city do you think actually receives the most rainfall in a year? Is it Everett? Spokane, Seattle, or Olympia. Perhaps you've lived in some of these other places besides Everett might have an inkling as to who might receive the most amount of rain. All right, so it's actually Olympia. Olympia is the winner here in this of four is Olympia receives about 48 inches of rain a year. And in a close second is Seattle and Everett, which receive around 37 inches of rain in a year. And then Poor little Spokane only gets about 16 inches of rain as hopefully none of you actually picked Spokane. Um, you know, with Spokane being on the other side of the mountains, they have a very different water system than us um, and the amount of rain that they receive in the year. So I don't know about you, but when I think about 37 inches of rain a year, it's kind of hard to really fathom what that really looks like. So we can actually calculate that. Um, so we're gonna do that here. We're gonna take a 1200 square foot home and we're going to think about a one inch rain event. I'm sure we've all heard that maybe when you're listening to the weather at night, they'll say, oh, you know, Everett received one inch of rain. So we received one inch of rain and we've got this 1200 square foot roof. How much rain is that really? So if we're gonna calculate it into language that we understand, it's about 600 gallons of water that is flowing off of this 1200 square foot roof. So that gives you a better indication of how much water we're talking about with, instead of just one inch of rain. So as you saw on the last slide, Everett gets about 37 inches of rain in a year. So when we're talking about that, let's calculate that out to in a year, how much rain is that coming off of this 1200 square foot home? 
it's 22,000 gallons of water. Little bit more than you would think when you're thinking 37 inches of rain. So that's a lot of rain. And remember, this is just for one 1,200 square foot roof. So in case you wanna go back and do this on your own, you can do this yourself. You can learn how to calculate how much water is actually coming off of your roof. So you're gonna take the square footage of your roof. You can actually do that either by going out and measuring the width and the length of your home on the outside with a tape measure, or you can actually look on Google Maps. Google Maps has a scale if you look at the bottom of the page. So you get that square footage of your roof or you know, the surface area of your home. And then you're gonna multiply that by rainfall in feet, which um, as we did with the 37 inches, that ends up being about 3.08 feet. And then you're gonna multiply that by this number that they've come up with. I have no idea where it came from, but it's a number that they use when they're calculating this is something called roof efficiency. So if you have a metal roof, it's different than if you have a composite roof. So you're gonna take those numbers and you're gonna pick one of those two, depending on the type of roof you have, and then you're gonna multiply it with that conversion number. That's so that you can go from that feet number to the gallons number. So this is something that you can do tonight for fun <laughs> if you want to figure out how much rain is coming off of your property so that you have a better idea of how much rain your property is having to deal with on a daily basis. I do see a couple of questions in the chat. I just want to make sure that nothing, this is clear and everyone understands this. But so if there's any questions about how this calculation works, let me know. They're all good. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so we've talked about something that's coming from a home. Now let's move to a parking lot. So this is a one acre parking lot. So probably for a big box store, which we've all seen and maybe even been to. So if we have a one inch rain event on this one acre parking lot, whoops, I already gave away my, oh no, I didn't. Okay, there it is. The one inch rain event, you're talking about 27,000 gallons of water that is coming off of this one parking lot in a one inch rain event. So that's a lot of water, but I'm ready to blow your minds with how much water it is in a year. So we've getting, like I said, we get 37 inches of rain a year in Everett. And so for this one acre parking lot, over the course of a year, if it gets 37 inches of rain, we're talking 1 million gallons of water. That is a lot of water. It's a lot of water that obviously I'll get more into later. It has nothing stopping it from running right off. There's nothing that is absorbing it, nothing that is holding it from just running right off that parking lot. Potentially, there are some ways that um, certain businesses and things do deal with stormwater runoff, but Again, just the idea of that's how much water is having to be dealt with from this one property. So I believe that Carrie kind of mentioned this, or excuse me, Kari mentioned this a little bit earlier, is rain does like to flow downhill. And Everett has about 22 drainage basins. And the map is obviously fuzzy. You're not gonna be able to pinpoint each one of these, but just to kind of highlight what this means is, each of those little areas that have the different colors with kind of a gray outline, each one of those is a drainage basin. And those outline parts, so the parts that are in gray are outlining each of the different basins, shows you that that's the highest point in that basin. And so that everything is flowing down into that basin. So for example, I kind of highlighted the Pigeon Creek number two there with the little water drops. So that those little water drops are showing you that's where that creek is. And so the water is flowing down into that creek and then it's ultimately going out into three different kinds of watersheds. For this example, it's obviously going out into the Port Gardner Bay or Puget Sound, depending on how you like to frame it. But there are three different watersheds within the city of Everett. So some of these basins will flow into Lake Washington eventually. Some of them go into the east side over to the Snohomish River, and then some go into Port Gardner Bay. So we have 22 of these basins that are really helping all that water flow down and out. So it's flowing into our creeks and then it's flowing out into our local waterways. All right, so this is more of that typical landscape that we see 
outside, right? This is our kind of our more man-made drainage. So where is all that rainwater flowing? So it's flowing off of that parking lot that we showed earlier. It's flowing off of our driveways and sidewalks and our lawns and our gardens. And it's flowing into things that we call storm drains. So these are those little grates that you see on streets. So those are the storm drains. And then once it's in the storm drain, it gets caught or we call it a catch basin it gets put in that basin and then it gets put into a pipe and it travels either to a local creek or then it eventually will flow into local waterways like Port Gardner, Puget Sound, Lake Washington, all those kind of places. So as you saw in that first slide when we we're talking about drainage basins, it's actually the same kind of system in our man-made system here. But as you noticed in both occasions, stormwater runoff, which is what we as a city call that rainwater, we call it stormwater, and it flows and it's running off, it travels untreated from our storm drains into our local waterways, okay? There's nothing stopping this. It's going straight into that grate or that storm drain into a pipe, and then it's flowing into our local waterways. There's no treatment happening at any point in this time, okay? So when we're talking about these man-made drainage systems, Sometimes you'll hear people say it's a separate system. And we like to use easy, simple terminology here at the city. So when you hear separate system, it means that your sewer and your storm is separate. So anything that's in your house that's going down any kind of drain, whether it be a toilet or you're taking a bath or taking a shower, all of those things are going into a pipe and that pipe is going into a sewer pipe, and then that pipe is carrying all of that sewage to a treatment plant where it's getting treated, and then once it's treated, then it's put out into local waterways, okay? So that's after it's been treated. On the other hand, you've got your storm system. So when it rains, all of that water, like we said, is flowing off of our local areas. It's going into a storm drain, which goes into a catch basin, which Honestly, a basin is just pretty much like a like a tub or like a square that's just holding that water so that it can go into a pipe and then it goes in that pipe and then it goes into our local waterways. So that's how it mostly occurs in most places. So the drainage is happening just as I just went through. So all that water when it rains, it's flowing off of our landscaped areas that we maybe kept green with some fertilizer to keep it nice and green. We've got someone here walking their dog on the sidewalk. That dog is probably pooping <laughs> and hopefully that owner there is picking it up. You've got us driving out on the streets with our cars. And then all of that stuff, as that water goes along, it goes into that storm drain, like I said, into a catch basin, and then it goes along on a pipe and it travels unfiltered into local streams and creeks. So the city of Everett has over 10,000 catch basins. So that's what we call it. We don't usually use the terminology storm drain. We such catch, we call it a catch basin. And so those actually get looked at once a year. Um, and then they sometimes will have to be almost we use vector trucks to clean them. A vector truck is um, something you may have seen. It has like a big water tank on the back and it has um, kind of big pipes on the side and it works like a vacuum. They pretty much will go in there, take off the grate, they'll put in this big vector pipe and pretty much just vacuum up the area. So, um, you know, we maintain over 10,000 catch basins within the city of Everett. Okay, well Everett, along with Seattle, are a little bit more complicated. And the reason why we're a little bit more complicated is because in North Everett, we have something called a combined system. So for those of you who live in North Everett, you may have heard this term before. And again, we like our simple terminology. Combined means exactly what it sounds like. Our sewer and our storm drain are combined together. All right, so based on the map that you see here, all the area that's in green, is considered the combined sewer area. So a combined system is something that um, is an older system. Um, most of it was put in around 1890s is when you know Everett was first getting established. A combined system was the way that most things were handled. So with Everett being an older city, a lot of the um, systems are still in place that create this kind of combined sewer system. So as you can see over here on the right, 
all of that water comes together and goes to our wastewater treatment plant. And those are some photos of our wastewater treatment plant, which as you can maybe see a little bit on the map, in case you're not familiar, is the wastewater treatment plant is right to the east of I-5 right there. Um, we actually have a, um, if you're traveling on the highway and you look to the um, right as you're leaving Everett, you can see the lagoons that we use for the wastewater treatment plant. So how does the drainage work in your neighborhood? So if you live in the combined system area, it is a little bit different because we know that it's all combining together. And as you can see from this picture, anything that comes from our home goes down a pipe into a much larger pipe. Anything that's raining and falling goes into our storm drains and goes into the same pipe. And all of that gets combined together and diluted storm water and diluted sewage goes to the wastewater treatment plant to be treated. Okay, I will say we're not gonna go into a lot of detail about it, but um, there are obviously some issues that can happen with a combined system, um, especially with a lot more people living here, also having a lot more intense rain events. This can overwhelm this system because it is an older system, but it's also very, very, very expensive to replace. So there really are some ways, which I'll get into later, that the city has tried to help alleviate some of the pressure off of the system. And it really is great because it ends up being a uh, a boon for stormwater and because a lot of the practices that help with this system also help in general with stormwater. All right, so we've talked a little bit about water. We talked about how much water we're really talking about. We talked about where it goes and where it ends up. But let's go back in time a little bit. Let's actually talk about how nature in general dealt with water before we all got here and kind of took over. So really the natural water cycle dealt a lot with evapotranspiration, which means those plants were working really hard. They were taking in a lot of that water that was coming. They were soaking it and holding it. Um, and then once it would land on the ground with all the, you know, greenery and nature, it was able to kind of slowly penetrate into the ground. And that was how we got a lot of that deeper infiltration that would help recharge our groundwater system. Um, you know, it would go back up into the system and come back down. And really, you would only see about 10% of that water not really being used for much. And so it would run off into local creeks and rivers. So really that number right there that you see, that 10%, that's something to keep track of. Because as you can see here, when it's just the natural cycle, you're looking at maybe 10%. And remember, we were talking about that one parking lot being 1 million gallons of water in a year. So 10% of that would flow off, for example, or 37 inches of rain in a year, okay? Well, then people started coming. So then we kind of got our residential, which is a good way to kind of talk about the transition, because really you're talking about there's still some greenery, there's still some landscaping, you've got some trees, but you're starting to see homes and driveways and construction. And so really what that creates mostly is compaction. There's a lot of compaction going on because, as I'm sure most of us have had, if you own any kind of home, when you go out there and you start digging in your lawn, you realize compaction is a real thing that happens with a lot of construction because they will use parts of your property to, you know, stage things. So it really will just sit there and compact that soil down. So when you have a lot of compaction going on, you don't have a lot of infiltration going on because that water is not able to penetrate deep enough to really infiltrate and recharge that groundwater. You also have less trees, so you're going to have less evaporation transpiration going on. So really, we've started to see an uptick in the amount of runoff. So we went from our 10% to now being more like 20 or 30% and more of a residential area. Then we come to our urban reality. So this is where we're starting to have a lot more buildings. We've got our parking lots and sidewalks and roads and highways and skyscrapers um, and very little green. So even in some of the greens, it's maybe not very much green. So we really are talking about most of the land being 
unable to take in that water. So your amount of infiltration has gone down way more. Um, and then your amount of runoff has wildly increased to the point where it's 55% runoff. So more than half of that water that is flowing are coming down off the, out of the sky, 55% of it is just running off. It's got nowhere to go, it just is running off. So that 55% of runoff, what does that really look like? So here's some examples of what it looks like. It looks like Maybe your storm drains that are plugged up so that you have some overflowing of storm drains. You may have some flooding on your roads. You may have some landslides happening. You may have sinkholes where the water is washing the ground underneath our roadways. So a lot of these things are um, happening because of the amount of runoff from our surfaces because they're not able to infiltrate anywhere else and water is a powerful thing so some of the examples that aren't here is also when it actually does go into natural waterways you're talking about a lot of stream erosion or sediment buildup because of the corrosive quality of this water as it gets gushes and it's not able to slow down um, it can really even affect the stream health of certain areas too and obviously, you're also not going to see any recharging of your groundwater if that water is just running right off and it's not able to really infiltrate into the ground. Okay, so we've talked about water, we've talked about how much water, we've talked about where it goes, how it drains, how water likes to move. But then as a city, how do we deal with this stormwater? Because remember that 55% is a pretty large number. So when you're talking about stormwater, how do cities deal with it? Well, one of the major ways that we deal with it are detention ponds. So um, I don't think I'm able to really see the show of hands, but I'm sure some of you have detention ponds. And if you don't, you probably have one in your neighborhood. Um, they always make me laugh when I see them because they're these fenced in natural areas. Um, and it's always rather amusing when you fence in a natural area. However, it's obviously because it's city property and that's the reason why we do it. But these detention ponds have a purpose and the dry and wet, really the difference between the two is if you have a dry detention, excuse me, a dry de detention pond, say that 10 times fast, it's really only holding that water during a rainstorm. So when it's not actively raining, it's usually dry. It'll have grass, like in this case, it may have some other kind of plants that can handle um, not having water in it intermittently. So those are dry detention pond. Wet detention pond really kind of acts the same way. It'll hold that water, but it'll infiltrate it out through a pipe of some sort. It's just not as fast. So it's a slower process. Um, and the wet, the amount of rain that you see in a wet detention pond can vary. It can be very little and still be considered a wet detention pond. Then you have something called a retention pond. A retention means it's retaining that water. So this is more of a pond. It will continue to have water in it year round. Um, there's also a lot of these that you will see um, at kind of HOA areas. So a whole HOA will have a retention pond or maybe a business or a large apartment complex may have a retention pond. So these are those ways of kind of holding a lot of that water that is running off in a way that it's able to hold it so that it's not flooding certain areas. It's not overwhelming the system in some of the other areas. Okay, so you've got your detention ponds and your retention ponds. Another way that cities deal with stormwater runoff is a way that you don't see. This is underground. So in a lot of parts of the city, we actually have things called vaults or CDs. So this is actually an example of a CD on the right. And really the only reason why it's called a CD is I, I honestly don't know what CD means, but what it adds to the system is it actually will filter a little bit of the um, input that's coming. So it'll take out a little bit of the trash and, deb and debris. For example, the picture that you see here is actually one that was installed um, near Everett Mall Way. Um, there is a detention pond there that was seeing a lot of sediment buildup and it was becoming kind of a maintenance 
issue. And so by putting this in there, it kind of alleviates some of the pressure on the system so that we can take out some of that sediment and debris and trash because it's a very high traffic area that helps take out a little bit on the front end before it goes into the pond. And again, it gets maintained in the same way that the catch basin did. So that's again, where that vector truck comes in that has this really humongous pipe that it can put in there and kind of use it like a vacuum and clean out all the trash and debris from there. The one on the right, I mean, on the left is more of a vault. So it's really just a holding box. It just holds that water. You're really, we, the whole idea with the city up until a certain point is all about how can we hold that water to not have flooding. So that's really what these different mechanisms are is just a way to kind of hold that water, not really treat it necessarily, but hold it so that it's not creating flooding or issues in people's neighborhoods. All right. So We've talked a lot about that journey of water so far from how it's coming from the sky and how it slowly is flowing into our local waterways. But we haven't really talked about what's in this runoff. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna start using the terminology more of storm water than rainwater. Um, so really, what's in it? Do we think it's healthy? I mean, if you're looking at this photo right now, all I see is water going into a storm drain. I don't really necessarily see any quote unquote pollution in it. I see some leaves maybe, um, but really a lot of times when we think of storm water that it just looks like rain and it's really hard to think about is it healthy or not? Do we assume that there's maybe some pollutants in here? Well, here's an example of in this potentially all the storm water runoff, what might actually be in that storm water runoff. These are things that we may not be able to see, but through our everyday lives, these are things that are probably, or maybe I should say more than likely in our stormwater runoff. So I'm just gonna highlight each one of these later, but I do wanna just highlight some of where these potential sources are for this. Trash, obviously that's from all of us. Um, a really interesting thing is that the state of Washington has kind of started to do a litter campaign, which is great. Um, I've always felt like schools, I remember when I was in school, we used to have like, what was it? Um, give a hoot, don't pollute or anything like that. And I feel like there really hasn't been a lot of that, but I've started to see a lot more trash and debris in our local waterways. And so being able to bring that to the front again is important. And really a lot of what that trash is that people are finding are, are it's really the small trash. It's the, let's say you've bought a thing of chips and you just rip off a corner and that little corner piece just kind of falls off or you're taking your straw out of a little piece of paper and, or plastic and that plastic kind of gets lost from your straw. Those are the little kind of people think are not a big deal that can really accumulate into the system. And so it's something to be aware of when we're talking about trash. It's not just those really big pieces of, you know, somebody just threw away their McDonald's, you know, leftover dinner. We're also talking about that really small pieces of trash because it really can be built up to a large amount of litter. Sediment is something that really usually comes from construction, um, whether, and I don't mean just like, construction companies, I mean any kind of construction, even if we're doing it at our home, um, we may, you know, do something in our front yard and, and are in our front driveway and use our hose to kind of wash it off and it goes into our storm drain that usually has a fair amount of sediment in it. Um, so that can also be considered a pollutant for stormwater. Um, and then we have all those things that come from washing, you know, having our cars in our life. So we've got car oil, we've got antifreeze leaks, we've got heavy metals that are coming not only from our tailpipes, but from our brakes systems. Brake dust is another thing. And then obviously pet waste. Pet waste is a big thing. And honestly, you could probably even say animal 
waste here, but we like to focus on pet waste because we feel like that is an area where each person can take responsibility and do something about pet waste, whereas that may not necessarily be true for a raccoon. So that's the reason why we tend to focus on pet waste here. And then pesticides and fertilizers. So these are something that we like to use on our lawns to make them look pretty, um, but if used incorrectly, they really can cause havoc in the system. So these are a lot of things that are flowing in our stormwater runoff that we may really have no idea when we see that water flowing down by our curb into the drain that there's all these things that are actually in it. All right, Kari, I'm going to stop sharing my screen in just a minute, but I, I do want to just highlight what this is. So this is um, just a really nice video of um, of this woman named Laura James, who went out, she loves to scuba dive. I think these are off of Alki, if I'm not mistaken. And it really just, she was mortified when she was out scuba diving and it got her to really think about what's happening. And so this is a great video that shows that. So it's just a couple of minutes and um, yeah, I think that's it. So am I stopped sharing or am I still sharing? There we go, right? Here, one second. Ah, okay. <laughs> Laura James has been diving in Puget Sound. Hmm. Um, for more than 20 years. Just the feeling of being weightless. It's just like flying. The animals are fantastic and, and so different than anything you'll ever see up here on the surface. It's kind of like going into Wonderland. I don't think that people realize what a gym we have. It's the Emerald Sea. It's got so much life. The cold water uh, has more nutrients. It can hold more oxygen, hold more nutrients than warm water. So you get tremendous invertebrate marine life. You get octopus and bull tails and all sorts of sea slugs, just every color of the rainbow. The wild and crazy animals you see underwater they're kind of like Alice in Wonderland to me a little bit. You go beneath the sea and it's you're in this different world and it's mesmerizing and brilliant. In addition to the abundant life, James also witnesses a deadly form of pollution. We'd swim along and we'd see this decaying swath, black and dead leaves and like garbage, bubblegum wrappers and the straws, like stir straws from um, coffee and coffee, coffee cup lids and very random things. And it, it didn't, I didn't understand what I was seeing. One day she came across something in the water that has haunted her ever since. We were coming up the slope and I saw what looked like um, a piling and it was this big black column. And, and as we got closer, I realized that it was actually a storm outfall and it was so full of um, road grime and who knows what, that it, it, it was just black and it was just billowing and billowing and it was, it just doesn't stop. When I saw that stuff flowing into Puget Sound, I was just like, what is in this? And of course went home and I started looking it up on the internet. I'm like, what's in stormwater? And I'm like, we don't want that there. Stormwater is a toxic cocktail of sediment, grease, tire wear, and any litter small enough to slip into storm drains. And that's just what you can see. There's much more we can't see. Microscopic particles of heavy metals like copper and zinc are commonly found in urban highway runoff. There's also oil and petroleum-based hydrocarbons. Contrary to what a lot of people think, Runoff is Puget Sound's biggest source of pollution. Approximately 50% of the region believe that stormwater is treated, is captured and then conveyed for treatment to a treatment plant of some type, um, when in fact this 
doesn't take place. And almost all of this water goes off totally untreated. Throughout the United States, so much land has been paved over that the total amount of impervious surfaces would cover an area the size of Ohio. Every time water washes over these hard surfaces, pollutants pour into the nearest waterway. So all these impervious surfaces means that water can't get through them. Whereas if it rains in the forest, the water hits the ground and then very slowly seeps into the soil and the soil acts like a sponge. It slows down the water, it cleans the water, it filters it. Uh, and obviously uh, an impervious surface like pavement just doesn't do that at all. Jennifer McIntyre is leading a team that's studying how polluted runoff impacts aquatic animals. The team. Mm -hmm. There you go. April. Thank you, Kari. You're welcome. Okay, I'm going to try and get to my next screen. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to do it a different way. This is always the fun part. <laughs> so when I'm, um, how do I do the, oh, share sound? It's on. Never mind. Okay. Okay. That's okay. I want to give people a minute with that video. That video for me always um, just gives me a minute of just, it's overwhelming if you really think about it sometimes, you know, because this is, she used the term outfall. So what an outfall is, is when the um, water, you know, stormwater runoff goes into our local creeks and rivers. Sometimes it'll not only go that way naturally, to our larger area bodies of water, but we also have pipes that will um, take that storm water in a pipe and it will carry it to an outfall. So it's actually under the water um, deeper down so that that storm water runoff is going directly into, you know, Port Gardner, Puget Sound, Snohomish River. So all those things all also are happening. But what's astounding is that you know just like a lot of other things you can't see it and so you're not necessarily we're not always aware of where things are happening just like i'm sure with a lot of us when we you know flush our toilet when it goes into a pipe we don't really think about where it's going afterwards so the same thing is true with storm water there's so many things that we just don't see with our eye so it's hard to make those connections and so that's why that video is always so powerful for me because it's visually in your face and it's hard not to see what kind of um, damage stormwater runoff can do. Okay, so we're going to spend a little bit of time to talk about these pollutants and what they are doing in the system. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I do want to kind of just highlight each of the different kind of things that we find in pollutants in our stormwater. A lot of it is nutrients and that's nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, so I'm going to talk about what the pollutants are here, and then I'm going to pull them out and we'll talk about each one individually and what are the sources for a lot of these pollutants. But here I'm just going to highlight what some of the pollutants are. So there's also bacteria and pathogens in our stormwater runoff. Temperature is actually considered a pollutant. And the reason why is if something really hot um, is put into um, the stormwater, it can really affect our local waterways. A, a lot of the um, fish and things that live there, changing the temperature also changes the amount of oxygen available within a stream. So that really is also considered a pollutant. Pesticides and herbicides, soaps and detergents, sediment, which I've mentioned before, and then road runoff contaminants. So like metals and PAHs, which don't make me say, cause I'm very bad at saying it, but it stands for a polysilic aromatic hydrocarbon. So that's a fancy word for pretty much what comes from using our car and comes from our tailpipes. All right. So the first thing I mentioned in there was nutrients. A lot of these nutrients are coming from our nitrogen and phosphorus. And I'm sure if any of you have used any kind of fertilizers on your lawn, you're always looking at those numbers, those how much nitrogen and phosphorus is in my um, fertilizer that I might be using. 
So one of the things that we'll talk about later as we talk about natural yard care and some of the things that you can do, we're not necessarily trying to discourage people from never using fertilizers and pesticides, um, or so, excuse me, fertilizers, but I do, do wanna, the way that it's described in natural yard care is think twice before using. So just really be aware of, learn more about your property before using fertilizers, before you think about it. Also make sure you're reading those directions because as you're putting fertilizer on, if it's not being used or up, if your you know, plant doesn't need it at all and it's not taking it up, when that rain happens, it's just gonna carry all of that fertilizer with all that massive amount of nitrogen and phosphorus and it's going to take it into our local waterways which could really help promote algae growth and by having algae grow in our local waterways it really is decreasing the amount of oxygen that's available in there for a lot of the other critters that really depend on that creek or pond or lake so it's really a way that it's it may seem like a good thing, but it's actually can really kind of overwhelm the system very quickly. All right. And this one we have bacteria, bacteria and pathogens was the other one mentioned. And the biggest culprit in this is our pet waste. And again, I don't want to exclude wildlife poop in general. That's also an issue. A lot of the various types of poops that are out there from wildlife or from dogs carry an awful lot of pathogens and bacteria in it. And I think people tend to not think of it, but really pet waste should be considered sewage. It really does have a lot of things that can make our pets sick. It can make us sick. We can carry it on our feet into our homes. And so it's something that we really wanna take out of the system and so that it's not, it's not compostable. It's not biodegradable. It is something that we wanna put in a bag and we wanna put it in our trash. Because as you can see here, Snohomish County alone has over 173,000 dogs. That's a lot of dogs and they're generating a lot of poop. And so if people aren't taking the action of picking up after their dog, you're talking about 47 million <laughs> pounds of pet waste. That's a lot of pet waste. And then if you include all the wildlife on top of that, that we can't even, you know, necessarily being in control of, that's a lot of pet waste. And one gram of pet waste can have over 23 million types of fecal coliform bacteria. So fecal coliform, that's the kind of stuff like E. coli that can really kind of make us sick. So it's really important that we get that out of the system too. Pesticides. So this little critter here, I'm a big aquatic macroinvertebrate fan. I love them. I worked for them for with a number of years and I highly encourage everyone to just take a take a day and go grab a water sample from your local creek potentially and check out what kind of critters live there. There is a lot of macroinvertebrates that really depend on our local creeks and rivers and a lot of other things like fish and other kind of animals that actually depend on macro invertebrates to eat. Um, but really they're kind of like the insects of our streams. And they're also kind of what we use as indicators for the health of a creek. Because some of them can be really sensitive to certain things. They need a certain amount of temperature. They need a certain amount of oxygen. And if we're starting to use pest insecticides or anything like that, where we're trying to get rid of a pest, on our property, but it's somehow either you've put it on at the wrong time or it's not you know, been diagnosed incorrectly and you're using something that just is, serves no purpose, then again, that's the kind of thing where it's just gonna go into our local waterways and it's going to be affecting other critters and other insects that you may not have necessarily thought of as a pest, but you're affecting their abilities to survive in their waterways. The other thing with pesticides is they have been found to really have um, a lot of impact on salmon. Um, and the biggest reason why is because pesticides can affect the sensory or the nose of a salmon. And um, if you know anything about salmon, their sense of smell is extremely important for homing, for feeding, for reproduction, and for predator avoidance. They use their nose to do all those things. And if it somehow can get aggravated by certain um, things that are in pesticides, it really can be a lethal um, thing for a lot of salmon. 
And then our good old cars. Our good old cars, unfortunately, are a big pollutant in our area um, with heavy metals. And like I said, with the arsenic and the cadmium and lead and mercury, all these things are coming from different parts of our vehicles. So one of the things that we're about to watch one more little video. And um, what's interesting about this video is because um, first and foremost, back in, let me see if I have it in my notes here. I think it was in 2010, there was a study that came out saying that brake pads in vehicles had a high amount of copper that they were releasing. You know, as you were using your brakes, the brake dust would have a, a large amount of copper in it and it would, you know, go onto our streets and then the water would pick it up and carry it into our local street uh, streams and creeks. And it really, as I showed before, the copper was having a large um, an effect on salmon and their mortality rate. And so one of the things that Washington State did is they actually passed a law saying by 2025, I believe it is, that copper needed to not be in brake pads anymore. So all the brakes that we have here in Washington State no longer have copper in them. And so it's one way that science is able to affect laws and what is actually created and can create change. So um, Jen McIntyre, who you just saw a small snippet of in the last video, actually led a team to do some investigating because what they were finding is that salmon were continuing to have large mortality rates. And what they noticed, the connection they made is these high traffic areas where a lot of cars are traveling, these kind of corridors where the highways are, were really kind of the areas where they were seeing the high salmon mortality. And they really weren't quite making the connection as to what was the cause of this. So it was kind of an interesting um, thing that they became aware of that was the pollutant that was causing such issues. We're here at Longfellow Creek in West Seattle, and this is one of the first places where 20 years ago we were documenting how many fish were dying when they came back to spawn. We have this chemical soup that washes into these creeks in the fall when it rains, and we know that there are thousands of chemicals in that soup. So what chemicals are killing the coho? Is it 100 chemicals acting all together to kill the fish? Or could it be one or two chemicals that are just really toxic? My name's Ed Kalerje, and uh, I pretty much work at the intersection of water, chemicals, and fish. When it rained, we saw a whole bunch of chemicals from the roads in the creeks. So we started collecting water samples and trying to figure out what chemicals were in these creeks when the salmon died. We pretty much figured out that anywhere there's a road and people are driving their car, um, little bits of tire end up coming off your tire and ending up in the stormwater that flows off that road and even into the urban creek. When we discovered that it looked like tire wear particles were the source of these chemicals, what we did is we made a whole bunch of tire particles and then we passed water over those particles as if it was raining and water was flowing over them. And now what happens is that you get chemicals actually dissolving from the tire particle into the water and it killed the fish. And that's the time that our group is coming in because we are really good at chemistry. We are the environmental chemist and we figure out the chemical in there and turn out to be a totally unknown chemical. The chemical that seems to be really problematic and toxic to these fish is actually a preservative for tires. And to finally be able to identify the cause of that mortality is, is really groundbreaking. To be able to get to the point where you're identifying a single chemical, and especially a new chemical that nobody had previously known was there, is very unusual. I hope we can get to a point where we have salmon safe tires. 
tires that are safe for not just humans driving on them, but also the fish and the organisms that are exposed to roadway runoff. I think that's important. Okay, so the chemical that they're talking about is the C, is that uh, 6 PPD quinone. So this is, as they stated, so they were looking at certain things. And so it's quite a process to figure out this tire preservative, because if you look at the individual things that are in a tire, so when they're talking about this, hey, there's a tire preservative that's in this tire, none, nothing listed there was lethal, nothing listed there was illegal or anything. They all were within the parameters. But once it got into a water system, it created this entirely new chemical that is not listed because it it was partly came together because of the stormwater. And so it's been interesting to see the beginning process of how working with tire manufacturers and trying to figure out what are some of the ways that we could look into having, as he said, salmon safe tires. So it's just another thing that there's just so many things within our um, uh, stormwater that there's just this continual process of discovery of what are potentially some of the issues. And then also what are some of the solutions that we can look at doing to help with that? And I'm trying to go to the next page and I'm just having a heck of it. Oh, there it is. Okay, great. Um, so to continue on, so that was part of, that was kind of when we were talking about some of the pollutants that come from our um, cars and things like that. Some of the other sources of water pollution are surfactants. So these are those soaps and detergents that we're using to whether wash our car, our driveways, our houses, our windows, all those things that we're doing outside of the home. Um, surfactants are interesting because part of what they do as if you've ever used Dawn or something and you know how in the old commercials, they would you know, do a drop of the Dawn and it would make the grease go like this. Well, it does the same thing when it gets in touch with, with water. It can also create um, the lack of surface tension. So when you have those kind of like water glider or insects that use the top parts of the water, it can actually um, not allow them to do that. Also, when you're looking at, it can also affect the gills of fish. Um, those surfactants and the quality of them can actually affect their exterior of a fish. Um, sediment loading, which I've already kind of talked about, um, you know, that can definitely affect the amount of oxygen that's available within streams and then temperature, as I've talked about already. All right, I know that's kind of heavy, I'm sorry, um, but it's it's the reality of what's in our stormwater. And so it's just something to be aware of because so much we don't see um, that there really is a lot of things that are within our stormwaters. So what do cities actually do with this? Because we're aware of these stormwater um, pollutants, but what do cities actually do about stormwater? Well, the big thing for us is I don't, I'm sure you have all heard of the Federal Clean Water Act. Well, I'm going to actually explain a little bit about what that is. So the Federal Clean Water Act requires that all cities, industry, and commercial facilities that discharge wastewater or stormwater directly from a point source into a water of the United States, so that water of the United States being a lake, a river, or an ocean, must obtain a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit, okay? So as a city, because we have, we're con it's considered our stormwater, it actually discharges into local waterways, which fall under the Federal Clean Water Act, we actually have to get a permit and follow that permit in order to discharge into our local waterways, all right? So these permits that we get are actually, even though it's from the US government, each state has um, an entity that actually does the permitting. And for Washington, it's Department of Ecology. So as a city, we have these permits and these permits actually help us and guide us to come up with ordinances, come up with laws um, and different things in order to help um, regulate 
what people can do with these stormwater systems and how they could pollute it. So, um, and not only do we as a city have it, but our wastewater treatment plants have it. Um, industry has to have certain permits in order to do what they do. So a lot of these fall under our national pollutant discharge elimination system. Okay, so these are permits that we have that help instill how we do business in the city of Everett. The really nice thing about the permit, or at least what I think is a really nice thing given my job, is that one of the larger components of the permit is public education. So we spend a lot of time um, trying to go out in the public and really inform the public about what is stormwater, what is in stormwater, how can they make changes to help alleviate some of the issues with stormwater. So public education is a really large piece of the permit. In addition to how we do business on our properties, how um, construction needs to happen, um, how industry needs to deal with their runoff. Um, when you're building, if there's certain areas where you need to have flow control for your stormwater. So all of these things fall under the permit. So we have a lot of guidance as to how we need to do business. All right. The other thing that's interesting about how cities have really changed is how they view stormwater. So as you saw in the past when we were talking about the detention ponds and the vaults, really that was quote unquote kind of an older way of looking at stormwater. Stormwater was all about flood and erosion control. Like how can we deal with stormwater as quickly as possible so that it's not flooding certain areas. So the goal was to deal more with flood control. So not about treating it, not about how to make it better, but just how can we hold it so that we're not creating issues. But really the new way that most cities deal with stormwater is we see it more as a resource. How can we mimic nature? How can we help infiltrate that water back into the system? How can we reuse stormwater? How can we make it cleaner? So there's really been a shift in the way that stormwater is viewed and how cities deal with it. Um, one of the ways that we have started to um, do that is instead of maybe a detention pond, maybe a rain garden. A rain garden is a great way to um, help slow down and infiltrate a lot of that stormwater. Um, it also creates habitat for wildlife. It looks maybe a bit prettier than some of our detention ponds. And so in certain areas, it really can be a good way to talk about um, rain gardens. So I'm just gonna give the basics of rain gardens here. Um, rain gardens don't work everywhere. You do need to have certain parameters for a rain garden, but where it does work, it is a great way to deal with the water. So for example, in this one, the water comes in through a pipe. It has a special kind of mix of plants and soil so that that water can come in. It'll sit there and it'll slowly infiltrate into the ground and it'll help grow those plants. And then you always have to have an overflow. That overflow is just to deal with a high influx of rain. And then really just to hi highlight that it's temporary ponding. A rain garden is not a pond, it is a garden. And a lot of times, depending on the sizing, you may not even see that water, standing water at all. So, um, so rain gardens are one option. A lot of times cities will use them in parks. Um, you know, new parks that are going in, they may put in a rain garden to help deal with the storm water that'll be flowing off of that property. Um, that's a really great way to do it. Another thing is pervious surfaces. So we don't have very many of these. Um, we only have a few locations where pervious surfaces are used. This is one example that's off of East Grand. I don't know if you've ever seen any kind of demonstration of pervious pavement, but it is fascinating to watch because if you look at this picture, you see just like, oh, it's just a road, you know, it's just a sidewalk, no big deal. But if you were, if they were to bring in like a tanker truck and dump the water directly onto the surface, it actually works like a sponge. It'll literally absorb that water. You will see nothing running off. It'll absorb it just like a sponge. So they really are able to take a lot of that water on and slowly infiltrate it into the ground as a great big sponge. Um, the biggest issues for cities, um, honestly, is the fact that the way that pervious pavement works is that it needs to have pores. So it'll have kind of like openings so that water can infiltrate into it. So if you were to put sand or other things like that into the system, it can clog 
uh, pervious surface. So when you're talking about big stretches of uh, roadway, that can become an issue for a city. But highly recommended, which I'll mention later, but I highly recommend things like this for your property, like a driveway or a sidewalk. It really is a really great way to um, take in a lot of that stormwater runoff. Bioretention is another way that cities will deal with stormwater runoff. Um, these are two examples. Bioretention is very similar to a rain garden, meaning it has a certain kind of soil mix in it. It has plants that can deal with it. It usually tends to be grasses. Um, and the reason why is they can be a lot of different shapes. They can be a lot smaller. They can be like V-shaped almost. Um, they can be in high impact areas where, um, you know, you don't necessarily want to have a big plant. You know, like the example on the left in a parking lot, you don't want to necessarily deal with invisibility for people. But this is a great way where there's a place where that rainwater can go in. It can run off the surface, go into a bioretention, and slowly infiltrate into the ground. And these can be highly versatile as to where they can be put. And like I said, they can be in really high traffic areas um, where they may just look like they're a planting strip, but really they're doing a lot of work in the dealing with stormwater runoff. All right. So that's some of the pieces where, of what the city is doing at this point. So again, we're, we, we we as a city are trying to find those way to mimic nature on a bigger scale. Like how can we deal with all this stormwater runoff to help slow it down, let it infiltrate and actually be able to also not create flooding in certain areas. So what can you do? It's time to talk about where the rubber meets the road. What can you do to make a difference with stormwater runoff? Because as Kari mentioned in the slide before we started, 75% of the pollutants in Puget Sound do come from stormwater runoff. So there is a fairly large impact that each one of you can make on that stormwater quality. And one of them is if you have a pet, it's to pick up your pet's poop every time, to bag it, put it in the trash. Um, and again, every time, um, it's always an important thing. And I just wanna mention here, I'm gonna do a little plug here. We actually on, on our website, if you see right there, we have everettwa.gov backslash pet waste. If you go there, you can actually take a pledge saying you will scoop the poop. And if you do so, I will send you a cool little kit. And that kit has bags, it has a little flashlight so that you can find the poop at night. Um, and then we also have these little carabiner, um, little, they're, I forgot what they're called. They're like little, um, shoot, I can't think of the name. They're like no hands holders. You can put that on your leash. And so you can put the bag on it so that you don't have to carry the bag yourself. You can make it do the work for you. So we're trying to alleviate all the barriers that are keeping you from picking up that pet waste. So you can go to everettwa.gov backslash pet waste, take the pledge, and I'll send you this lovely kit in the mail for you to help you do just that. All right. All right, we talked a lot about cars and how cars have a lot of different things that they're doing. And we're not at all telling people to get rid of their cars. We realize that it's a known entity, but there are certain things that you can do to help alleviate some of these pollutants. And one is to check for car leaks. If you feel like you have an oil leak or antifreeze leak or something that it's leaking, it's always kind of important to get those fixed as soon as you can. Use a car wash. Um, professional car wash when possible. Car wash companies are set up so that they are actually filtering that storm water um, or that car, sorry, the car wash water that's coming out off of your car as you're washing it. You really don't have those capabilities on your own property. So using a professional car wash when possible. But we also know that people love to wash their cars at home or people don't have the resources to spend money to do a professional car wash. And what we request at this is if you are washing your car at home to make sure that when that water is draining off of your car, that you're directing it to a landscaped area so that it's not going directly into a storm drain, whether that be a planting strip or a garden or however you're able to redirect that water so that it can actually go there first. And that'll actually help a lot by not having those soapy, dirty, metal, wash going directly into our storm drains. 
All right, some of the other things that you can do around your house is practice natural yard care. So there are five principles of natural yard care, and that's really the whole purpose of these garden classes that we do in the fall and in the spring is to really help people inform them about what they can do on their property to help alleviate their footprint on that stormwater runoff. And one is building healthy soil, plant right for your site, practice smart watering, think twice before using pesticides, and practice natural lawn care. So those are kind of the five principles that we really spend a lot of time in these classes talking about to help educate you so that you're making better choices when it comes to putting in your garden. To store toxic chemicals off the ground um, <clears throat> and putting them and disposing of them properly. I'm not sure if you're aware, but there is a hazardous waste um, drop-off center right here by Public Works. I think it's on McDougal and they are open Wednesday through Saturday and so you can go there and drop off any of your hazardous chemicals that you don't know what to do with or how to dispose of or if they're leaking or they're making a mess or you've decided you're going to go clean and you don't want to have any of that in your house anymore, you can actually take it there to have them dispose of it properly. All right, and the final thing you can really do is installing green stormwater infrastructure. That's a really big word, and it's a big word that we use with our city. Um, but really, what green stormwater is, is you're just mimicking nature. That's the whole idea behind green stormwater infrastructure, is you're slowing down that stormwater runoff. You're helping it spread out over a larger surface area. You're allowing it time to soak into the ground and that gives it time to filter out some of those pollutants. Those plant roots will work very hard and are able to take out a lot of those different kind of um, uh, pollutants that can be in our water. And kind of as I hinted, other kind of bonus benefit of, of green stormwater infrastructure is we actually find it to be a benefit not only in our separated areas of Everett because it's able to um, deal with stormwater runoff as a whole, but also in our combined areas of Everett. So if people are able to stop that stormwater runoff from going into those larger combined pipes, which tra travel to our wastewater treatment plant, this is a way to kind of help alleviate some pressure. And so that you on your own property can kind of deal with that stormwater runoff all on your own property. If you have a rain garden, it's able to infiltrate a lot of that water and keep it and, and take out a lot of those pollutants all on your own, okay? So when you're talking about following that water, if you remembered way back when, when we were following our water through our system, one of the things that can really help you when you're looking at your site is to spend a little bit of time and see how water moves on your property. Where is it going? Um, is it going into kind of your garden area? Is it just going down into a pipe into the ground, which is fine too, um, but really to kind of watch where water moves along your property. So not just on the roof, but along other areas of your property. And then as you look into areas that are kind of quote unquote trouble areas, there can be a lot of different options available as to how you could deal with that stormwater management on your own property. All right. So one of those things that we talked about, the benefits of a rain garden, is it really does help with property flooding. If you're finding that your property is having a lot of flooding, rain garden is one possibility. Again, it needs to have certain parameters, so it's not for everybody. But if it could work for you, then it really can be a great workhorse on certain properties. And then again, it's helping you get rid of some of that lawn, which is always nice for a lot of people. All right, rain barrels is another way. We actually at the city here look at rain barrels more as a storm water management tool. And what that means is on your property, you have, I'm sure as you noticed, remember when we talked about how much water comes off of your roof, if you have a rain barrel, a rain barrel is 55 gallons. It is not gonna be able to handle a lot of that water. So that's why we don't necessarily look at it as a water conservation tool because you're talking about an awful lot of water and you would need a lot of barrels in order to really feel an impact on that. But if you have a lot of that water coming off of your roof and going into a gutter and going into a rain barrel, you have control over where that water goes. You can direct where it goes. You could direct it to a local garden that you have. You could 
do it to your corner um, landscaped area that you like, or you can store it to use for your house plants or you know your pots, whatever you want. But that's really the 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 key part about a rain barrel is it can help you have control over where that stormwater goes on your property. All right. So one of the really nice things is is that. Um, it really helps keep that water away from your house, especially if you're having any kind of standing water issues around your foundation area. And it's because you maybe have a gutter that has a splash block or maybe doesn't have a splash block, but it's not really helping with that water. A rain barrel could be a great way to hold some of that water and again, direct it where you wanna go. Um, and the other actually thing is there's been studies that show that instead of using a hose to water your garden, um, Rainwater can be a lot better on your plants than necessarily hose water. And it's free because it's rainwater. All right. And then finally, just to kind of finish up, um, not only are we, you know, we talked a lot about what you can do on your property, but it's bigger than that. It's what can you do in the community? It's picking up pet waste when you go out to a park um, with your dog, or even if it's not your dog, picking up litter if you see it, making sure you're putting it in the trash. Um, adopt a storm drain in your neighborhood that you feel like is continually clogged with leaves. Um, it's a great way to help make sure that that water can flow easily into a storm drain. And then honestly, getting out there and helping educate the public and educating people as you go in your life about um, what's in storm water. All right. So I think we're coming to the end. Hopefully most of you made it through to the very end. So we talked a lot about how much water we're really talking about on our properties. We talked about how water likes to travel down, downhill. It's always going downhill. It's going through our basins into our watersheds. It's picking up things as it goes. It's pulling all of those things on our gardens and our driveways and our sidewalks and our cars and our parking lots and it's traveling into our local waterways all right so there's a lot that we can do as a city and a lot we can do as people to help change the quality of that water and I hope that I've given you some examples of how you can do that and then finally in closing before we get to see if there's any questions I always like to end my presentation with information on Public Works. So Public Works has a 24-7 number that you can call at any time, day or night, to report pollution or any other concerns that you may have that are Public Works related. So anything having to do with traffic lights, streets, um, sidewalks, water, sewer, storm drains, any of those things, spills, um, anything that you see, that number is there for you um, to reach out and let us know, because really we know more things the more people tell us. So it's always helpful to know that there is a resource available to you to get in touch if you see anything. So thank you. And yeah, Kari, let me know or let me know if there's any questions. There are not any questions at the moment, but if any oh. if you have a question, please put it in the chat box or the Q&A. Looks like no questions. Well, Woo! Well, yeah. Either, either that means I did great or. <laughs> it's very interesting. It's it's a lot of information, but I mean, mm -hmm. there is a lot to it. So um, I'm putting a survey link in the chat. Oops, you just muted, Kari. I clicked the wrong bit. Okay, I'm putting a link in the chat for the survey. So if you have comments or feedback, please add that there. Um, I will be sending out this recording um, tomorrow. Tomorrow's Friday already. Um, and with the video and then also the links that have been put in the chat. So if you didn't grab those now, you'll get them then tomorrow. And please tell your friends. Um, we'll be back next week. Um, same time, same place uh, for uh, the wet feet gardening, which I'm excited about because I love native plants and I, I do believe the rains are going to return. So I want to be ready um, for that. Do you want to, Kari, do you have any more about next week? Just to kind of just wet people's whistle, as oh, they say, about yeah. what next week is? 
Yeah, it will be about native plants. It will be about plants that definitely are better at uptaking water and they can soak up some of that stuff at the same time, rain gardens and what they do in that kind of plant thing. Um, also just the, the flip side of what happens now, we go through this very wet time, which plants are gonna be able to handle going into a drier season that are gonna be able to sustain on your property and kind of how to handle that. So. Yeah, we are moving. It's it's this little seesaw that we're on of between dry and wet um, and kind of never the twain shall meet. Is that the quote? So that's what Sarah will be talking about next week. And just a final shout out for the rain garden tour. This is actually going to be in person and it's the first time in a couple of years. So if you want to just hang out on a Saturday morning and go look at some garden and get some inspiration, um, please sign up and we'll see you on October 15th. Yeah, and I will be putting everett.eventbrite.com into the chat there. Um, very simple, if you got to this class, you know where to go <laughs> for the others as well. So thank you so much. Any questions, because there's still people hanging out. So if you wanna put those in the Q&A, you're welcome to do so. There weren't any on Facebook um, and I put some of those links out there too. So. Okay. Sounds good. Well, they at least have a number now, so they can get in touch if they need to. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And thanks, Virginia, as well. Thanks, April. Thanks, City of Everett, for sponsoring this. And we will call it a night. Have a good evening. Thank you for coming in through the chat. That's awesome. Good. Have a great night. Bye. Bye.